So um, it gives me great pleasure actually to introduce Chris Elders, um, who comes from the School of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Curtin University. Um, but his uh, formative years were spent in Oxford, where he did both his undergraduate and his PhD <clears throat> last century, last millennium. Um, after which he spent three years working with Shell and then returned to uh, the academic life um, at the University of London, Royal Holloway. And then after some time there, um, he returned to, not returned to, he came to Curtin University um, as the Chevron Professor of Petroleum Geology, which is where he is today. Um, and I'm pleased to, pleased to uh, introduce him on behalf of not just the school, but also um, the International Ocean Discovery Program Consortium that, is, uh, that, that Chris is part of, and also the Basin Genesis Hub, which Chris is part of. And um, so without further ado, Chris, I invite you to tell us about the evolution of the Northwest Shelf, and thank you very much. Thanks very much, Louis. And, um... Uh, well, good morning or good afternoon from a beautiful, sunny and warm Perth. <laughs> We're enjoying a particularly nice day today. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, the Noongar people who are the custodians of the land um, from which I am speaking to you and to acknowledge their elders past, uh, present and, um, and emerging. So yes, as uh, Louis uh, indicated, uh, a lot of the work I'm going to talk to you about today, well, is, is the work that I've been doing since I came to Curtin, which is now about seven uh, years ago, and most of that comes under the auspices of the, um, of the Basin Genesis Hub, um, uh, of which uh, Louis is also part, along with people at uh, Sydney and uh, Melbourne. So, um, oh, no. Oh, there we go, moving on, okay. So I'm sure you all know where the Northwest uh, Shelf is, the Northwest Shelf of, um, uh, of Australia. It's sort of traditionally divided into a number of separate basins, the Carnarvon Basin, the Canning Basin, or as it's more commonly referred to now, the Roebuck Basin. So the Canning Basin is more the onshore part, the Browse and the Bonaparte Basins. And sort of one point that I think I'll, I'll make a little bit is that that, that those subdivisions into different basins are a little bit artificial. Um, th there was a good basis for recognizing them uh, during the early stages of exploration on the Northwest Shelf. But uh, as we've gained, gained more and more information, the distinction becomes much less clear and different structural and stratigraphic features are important at different times during the evolution of the margin. And I think it's much better to consider it as an entire uh, continental margin that is made up of a number of different structural elements rather than distinct, uh, distinct basins. But we'll be focusing today on the, the Carnarvon Basin and parts of the adjacent, as they labelled here, Canning Basin, but also referred to as, the, I'll refer to it mainly as the Roebuck Basin, and we'll just venture a little bit uh, into the Browse Basin at um, one point in the, uh, uh, in the talk. So, in terms of the Northern Carnarvon Basin in a little bit more detail in terms of the structural elements and the tectonic setting of the basin. Um, we know that uh, the Argo Vistal Plain to the uh, northeast formed in the Middle Jurassic about 155 million years ago and the Gascoigne Abyssal Plain and the Cuvier Abyssal Plain are uh, in the early part of the Cretaceous. There are extensional margins and particularly the Cape Range Fracture Zone being a significant um, transform margin to this part of the um, uh, Australian continental margin. So the Northern Carnarvon Basin is made up of the, the Exmouth Plateau, uh, which is really part of the Triassic Basin, which in fact extended much further over to the, well, both the south and to the, uh, to the east. And then there's a series of marginal basins that formed during Jurassic rifting, the Exmouth, Barrow, Dampier subbasins, and then the, the Beagle subbasin is another, another one of these sort of rather funny subdivisions that doesn't quite have the same expression as the um, as the other ones. I'll just point out the Wombat Plateau to the north because we'll mention that in passing a little bit later on as well. 
So in terms of the sort of tectonic evolution, so our part of the Basin Genesis Hub, obviously our colleagues in Sydney and uh, uh, the G plates reconstructions that they do. So just to put it in that context, in the the uh, Triassic, so um, the, the, the reconstruction from the Carnian, I think that's actually something that's our understanding of this phase of the history of the margin is um, evolving. But I guess in broad terms, it it shows a spreading centres to the north and um, a passive margin, which in fact uh, probably post-states an important Permian rift event that we'll come to uh, later. A rift then propagated through the margin, separating the terrains that were in the position now occupied by the Argobissal Plain, I said that, happened at the end of the Middle Jurassic, and then in the Lower Cretaceous there was a plate tectonic reorganisation and the rift system, or let's say the not so much the, 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 the intracontinental rift, but the formation of the continental margins propagated south with the separation of Greater India from Australia, and then even later than that, um, Antarctica and Australia. So this sort of unzipping or unpeeling of the, um, of the margins. So in the uh, Northern Carnarvon Basin, at least, that is that those tectonic events are reflected in the, uh, in the stratigraphy. So the Triassic sediments, in large parts of the Northern Carnarvon Basin, sort of represent a, a post-rift thermal sag sequence, although as we'll see, the tectonics of the Triassic is in fact much more um, complex than that. Then starting in the Laurentian and um, developing progressively from west to east across the Northern Carnarvon Basin, the first phase of rifting occurred with um, associated with the deposition of what we'll see again is a very significant uh, shelf, uh, um, prograding delta and shelf system that's represented by the Athol and Legendre formations. Um, an unconformity marks the end of that phase of development and then there is deposition of a different sedimentary system uh, coming from the south uh, in the upper Jurassic and developing, um, culminating with the development of the, the um, a barrow group shelf uh, system in the Lower Cretaceous, the Valanginian unconformity marking that separation of Greater India and Australia, and then a sort of passive margin sequence um, developed after that, but punctuated by several episodes of uh, compression and um, uh, production of large-scale anticlines and inversion of some of the uh, some of the extensional faults. So to sort of see what that looks like in terms of cross-section, uh, I'm showing you this um, large regional line from the southwest part of the, um, the Exmouth Plateau, you can see the uh, very thick sequences of Triassic sediments. So the whole the Triassic sediments show very little change in thickness across the faults. It's a very uniform sequence, so hence its interpretation as being deposited in a post-rift sag basin, and then it's cut by relatively small faults that formed after the deposition of the Triassic and during the um, deposition of these Jurassic sequences. Uh, the thickness of that sequence, this is a uh, seismic two-way time scale on the side, but the, the thickness is debated, but um, round about 10 kilometers thickness of sediment. So it's a considerable, um, uh, thickness of sediments and you can see that the well from what, what we can image on the seismic data at least the um, the underlying possibly Permian aged sequences are unfaulted um, which is uh, uh, interesting um, and the, the there's a great deal of debate as to precise level of the crust that is present beneath this part of the um, Exmouth plateau what's the nature of the crust that has allowed this very thick sequence of sediments to accumulate. So you might sort of ask why, why do we not actually see the Permian Rift that I've uh, just um, alluded to? And uh, that is a good question that we might come back to, but I'll, well, here's some other deep seismic sections that do indicate more of the Permian uh, uh, rifting in beneath the Exmouth Plateau, but probably somewhat speculative. Where we really see that is on the um, uh, on the on the edge of the basin. So this seismic line is a little bit further to the northeast. So it cross, comes from the 
are the, the shelf edge through the Dampier subbasin, which is this Jurassic feature here, one of these marginal basins, then out across the Exmouth Plateau, where we have the thick Triassic sequences. And note also the very, very thin um, Jurassic uh, sequences, uh, sequences there. So um, the Permian Rift system, in fact, is imaged, and we'll see, see that in a bit more detail in a moment, on the, uh, on the flank of the basin where it's shallower and easier to, uh, easier to study. And the reactivation of those Permian age faults is probably what is largely responsible for the formation of the um, younger basins. So um, here is that, um, uh, that uh, Permian rift system. So again, we're in a sort of similar position on the southern flank of the Dampier subbasin to the previous line we were looking at. The, this little map above here shows actually a map of this uh, prominent fault plane that I hope you can see here. I know a lot of people at Curtin, when I talk about seismic data, they say, what are you talking about? I can't understand it, but uh, what is seismic data? But don't, don't be intimidated by it. Just think of it as an ordinary geological cross-section. You can see um, uh, layers that uh, correspond to different stratigraphic units, changes in density produce, uh, produce the reflections, and where those layers terminate is where you can see the, see the faults. So hopefully a little bit of interpretation there to, to, to help you. Uh, you can see this very prominent fault system here with these beds that are rotated and dipping against the fault, and we know those are of upper Carboniferous and Permian age, and very clearly by this unconformity shown in purple, which is the unconformity at the base of the Triassic. We have a Triassic sequence all the way through here, and then another unconformity. We're missing all the Jurassic in this area on the edge of the basin where everything's been uplifted, and this is the Valanginian unconformity that marks the, 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 final, the final breakup. So you can see very clearly um, evidence for rotation of those beds before the Triassic part of the, the, the Permian um, fault system. And we see it not only on the northwest shelf, but actually coming down the western side of Australia. Here's Shark Bay. Hopefully you can see on the uh, inset and a seismic line shown here. Again, we can see very large scale fault cutting through part of the sequence there. Again, rotated and dipping lower Paleozoic beds may include units as old as the Devonian or um, uh, even the Ordovician and Silurian may be represented. We don't know because the wells don't go this deep, but again, that same angular unconformity that marks the um, end of the rotation. These are probably Permian age sediments in here, and then Triassic sediments on top, and the Valanginian unconformity once again um, above that. So the Permian rift system is very widespread. We can map it um, all the way along the margin. So this was work that Amy Ianson did. She was one of the Basin Genesis Hub students working partly at Sydney and partly at uh, Curtin. And you can see her mapping of these Permian age faults all, oh, sorry, I've got the, I did all the, um, coming all the way uh, along the, the margin. If you can see it on the little inset map, it's these ones that are picked out in red. And in fact, we can now trace that fault system all the way down the edge of the Northern Carnarvon Basin um, to sort of just beyond the, um, the, the, the Cape Range Peninsula. Uh, so it's a, it, it's a very large prominent system and we can also actually see, we'll see parts of it further north in the Roebuck and Browse basins um, as, uh, as well. So that um, Permian Rift system, as I say, along this part of the margin uh, down here, probably resulted in very large scale thinning of the crust beneath the Exmouth Plateau. So there's debate as to precisely the nature of that crust, then that allowed the um, that, 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 that then allowed the subsidence which, in which the thick sequences of Triassic sediments um, accumulated. So this map shows the uh, thickness of those Triassic um, uh, sediments. And just to orient you again, here's the continental margin here, the Argo Abyssal Plain. So we're looking at this part of the continental margin here. So we're just sort of looking at the thickness of the Triassic sediments across this um, uh, this eastern end of the Carnarvon Basin and just where it extends into the um, Roebuck Basin. So it shows that in the Triassic there wasn't really a distinction between the Roebuck Basin and the um, Carnarvon Basin. But also this, I think this shape of the depot centre 
is very significant in telling us about the architecture of the underlying uh, Permian Rift. We can see purple, very thick sediments are uh, forming this sort of um, V-shape or narrowing shape as we go towards the, um, the, the Roebuck Basin. And um, so that suggests that the underlying Permian Rift was uh, focused in this area. We know that the, the marginal fault system that Amy could map out was extends all the way along the, uh, the, the southern side of the basin and to the south of this map, possibly a similar sort of fault system to the north. We don't know yet as to exactly um, what is a depth um, up, up, up there, but it looks that this sort of tapering shape of the post-drift thermal substance sequence suggests to me that the underlying rift was also tapering and dying out. In other words, a rift propagated across the Exmouth Plateau into the Roebuck subbasin and terminated somewhere around about this point. Interestingly, with a large igneous intrusion about the same time, uh, the bed out high forming at, at, um, forming at, that, um, at that time. So I think one important thing about the, uh, the way in which we understand the, the, the um, tectonics and the geological evolution of the Northwest Shelf is that uh, ideas are developed by people looking at relatively um, small areas and uh, there are seemingly competing and different interpretations but it's only when we put things together and appreciate the complexity of the different processes operating at all the way along the margin that uh, we can understand that those different observations are actually just telling us about different things that are happening in different places at the same time they're not necessarily different um, interpretation. So that's really uh, borne out by the, the Triassic, which as I say in this area labelled the Beagle Subbasin on this map is this sort of large thick post-drift thermal subsidence <coughs> sequence. But you can see up in the Rowley Subbasin again with blue colours there's more thick Triassic sequences uh, there. And if we look at the Triassic in this part of the margin we see that things are, um, are very very different. Excuse me. Um, I guess coughing online in a, is a COVID-safe way of uh, of, uh, of coughing. So um, we're going to look at the seismic line that comes through that thick sequence of Triassic sediments. So this is the same map, just showing you where it is inside this large red polygon, which is a very big 3D survey, which you can also see picked out here. And here, the Triassic is much more complicated. This is the top of the Triassic in orange. The bottom of the Triassic is probably these high amplitude reflectors, um, which I'm just pointing out now, which probably correspond to Permian age carbonates, which are quite well, are quite extensively developed, the end of the Permian or the beginning of the Triassic. And you can see that there's, well, dipping reflectors and significant unconformities present within the Triassic um, in, uh, in this area. So it's not a big, single continuous sequence like we see in the rest of the northern Carnarvon Basin. In fact it's probably just this thin little bit between the purple and the orange horizons that correspond to the much thicker sequences that we see further to the west. So we see there's quite a lot of deformation occurring in the Triassic in this area, dying out or terminating in the middle of the Triassic, and then you can see these very thick sequences of seismically transparent units which have been penetrated by these two wells, Anhalt and Hanover South, and perhaps slightly embarrassingly for the company that drilled the wells, they didn't find any nice Triassic reservoirs down here, but very, very thick sequences of um, mainly volcanic rocks, Triassic age volcanic rocks. So um, the, the wells only penetrated the top part of that sequence, where probably the whole of this sort of big wedge of transparent uh, seismic fasces is a and, and this this thick blue color uh, you see on the map here is a big thick pile of classic um, volcanics. So that part of the margin seemed to be um, active, and we actually see those same um, ev uh, evidence for those Triassic uh, active Triassic igneous activity in the uh, ages of zircons in the. Triassic sediments uh, in the uh, Carnarvon Basin. Um, this is from a number of wells you can see shown over here. Actually, the, these Triassic volcanic detritus was first recognized on the Wombat Plateau in one of the, um, uh, I guess, uh, DSDP or um, uh, wells, pre precursor to IODP, um, the expedition that uh, Neville Exxon was involved in. 
um, was, was the first evidence of Triassic volcanism in the detritus and Triassic age sediments on the Wombat Plateau, but we see them uh, throughout the, um, throughout the uh, northern Carnarvon Basin. There's also evidence of um, subduction-related volcanism in the Lhasa terrain that uh, in some reconstructions sits in where the Argo Abyssal Plain now is. And so the interesting suggestion is some form of uh, subduction zone. This is something that Sabine at, um, Sabine at um, Sydney is working on uh, in terms of who the, his reconstructions, a, a, a southerly directed subduction zone beneath the margin a sort of rift propagating through here into the um, Northern Carnarvon Basin. And it may be that southerly directed subduction that's driving the rifting and the pulling away of these microcontinental fragments on the northern margin of the, um, of the continent. But we also see that the, not only is there igneous activity at that time, there is active extensional tectonics. So um, in terms of uh, where we are now, just to try and keep up, uh, it's because we keep darting around the margin. It's 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 uh, important to try and keep a, a reference of where we are. So we were just looking at the seismic line through in the northern part of the Roebuck Basin with the thick volcanics. This um, seismic line is just uh, to the north of that, so just into the Browse Basin, and we can see these beautiful thick um, wedges of what are probably Permian Age sediments. So again, that Permian Age um, uh, faulting that's present across the whole of the margin. Uh, thickening nicely into the faults, showing those faults were active while the Permian sediments were being deposited. But in fact, that activity continues into the Triassic. So you can again see these nice wedges of Triassic sediments into some of those faults. So whereas the, the rifting had, the Permian rifting stopped in the northern Carnarvon Basin with that failed rift that I indicated, it continued, I think, um, further to the northeast in the Roebuck Basin and in the um, in the Browse Basin. So the next section takes us into the Browse Basin. So again, moving from here up into this area, the little box and the other map shows you exactly um, where we are. And uh, again, you can maybe see some dipping and perhaps faulted uh, sediments just to show you the interpretation of that. So again, the um, purple is the Triassic, the blue is an unconformity that separates Triassic and Jurassic sediments. Um, but there are clearly faults that are offsetting the Triassic by a relatively large amount, offsetting the Jurassic by only a small amount, which implies activity prior to the formation of that unconformity, reactivation later, other faults that terminate at that unconformity, and again, wedges of sediments thickening into faults. So if we compare a structural map of the, the base of the Triassic, this blue horizon here, and one at the top of the Triassic, we're able to see the difference between the older Triassic, well, let's say the, the, the map of this horizon will show faults that are active both during the Triassic and later in the Jurassic, whereas a map of this horizon will only show the Jurassic Age faults. So there's the Triassic fault map. There's the Jurassic fault map. You can see very clearly the difference in orientation between the faults of these more north, uh, northwest uh, um, trending faults um, seem to characterize the, the Triassic phase of development, whereas these more east-west trending faults are um, may have formed in the Triassic, but certainly have been reactivated in the Jurassic, and we see them propagating up higher into the sequence, but these older faults don't. So the important thing about that is that the extensional activity continued into the Triassic as we go further to the north, the northeast. So to summarize that part of the um, evolution of the margin, Yes, as a possible failed rift that propagated across the Exmouth Plateau, terminating in the um, Roebuck Basin. Extension continued in the Roebuck Basin, the Browse Basin, further to the northwest, and it was accompanied by significant volcanism. So the questions that raise is, what was the tectonic setting of the igneous activity? Is, it, is the idea of a southerly directed subduction zone correct? And I'm hoping that we can do some geochemical analysis, maybe not so much on the volcanics encountered in the wells, which are very heavily altered, but perhaps from the information we can get from the zircons that we've been dating in the sediments down here, that might give us some clues as to, as to that. It's also the question of how the Permian rifting then affected the later evolution of the margin, the Mesozoic rift events, particularly 
the nature of the crust that allowed this very thick sequence of sediments to accumulate and how the older Permian structures influenced the younger um, Mesozoic structures. So in terms of the nature of the crust underlying the um, Exmouth Plateau, that was more work that uh, Amy did for her PhD. So she uh, used the uh, underworld modeling code to try and simulate what happened after that Permian rift had formed. So this sort of thick um, unfaulted unit, you can see on the right hand end of the sections represents the, the sort of remnant of the, the ancient craton of the Pilbara craton that we see in uh, the, um, Northwest Australia um, and the, the, those big Permian basin, basin bounding faults. Before the model started, the, 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 the grab and the hanging wall of that fault was filled by this, these layers of lighter brown and yellow sediments, parallel layers representing that thick sequence of Triassic sediments. And then um, uh, different rates of um, extension were applied to that sequence. Uh, so we've got slow spreading on the left, intermediate or stretching, intermediate stretching velocities in the middle and fast velocities on the right. And then also the strength of the lower crust was, um, was varied to sort of think about what the different crustal architectures that might have been left behind by that um, <clears throat> rift from uh, weak at the top to strong on the bottom. And it's really these two uh, images in the middle that most closely, well, particularly this lower one, that most closely resemble the structures that, we, that I showed you on those regional seismic lines earlier, the marginal rift system that developed in the Jurassic, and then the distributed style of extension that um, occurs over the rest of the uh, Exmouth Plateau. So that uh, comparison is shown there. So that tends to suggest relatively strong uh, crust underlying the, um, the uh, Exmouth Plateau. Some people have suggested that that crust is just highly attenuated continental lithosphere. That's certainly um, reasonable. Uh, a more controversial suggestion has been made that it's a remnant of our Permian oceanic crust that formed as a result of that failed Permian rift. Um, and a, a third alternative is uh, some sort of metasomatized mantle. Um, I still, we've still got a little way to go before being able to um, address that completely. So that, that, that gives us some insights into the nature of the crust that was then affected by this Jurassic uh, rift event. Also, these large um, Permian age faults reactivated. So here's a fault you can see that, well, again, possibly Silurian and Carboniferous sediments thickening into the fault, showing activity during the deposition of those units overlain by Triassic, which is also present probably on the football side of the fault. So, the, so you imagine um, unfaulted Triassic continuing from the hanging wall into the football side of the fault, but then it's subsequently been offset when the fault reactivated during the, um, uh, during the Jurassic, and then that reactivated fault terminates at the Valanginian unconformity. So when the fault reactivates, they seldom, well, sometimes they just continue straight up, Sometimes they're offset, perhaps because the crest of the fault block has been eroded, maybe because a new fault has formed, in, rather than the fault propagating up, a new fault has formed in the cover, and the old fault reactivates, and they sort of meet in the middle, slightly offset from one another. But those bends in the fault produce folds in the hanging wall, and that's really very important to recognise that, because, again, a, a, a lot of time, these folds that people see adjacent to faults have been interpreted as a phase of compression, but, again, as this sort of um, fairly simple uh, modeling and reconstruction of the stratigraphy using um, structural forward models suggests those folds can be a result of reactivation of the extensional fold with this irregular geometry and as the hanging wall moves over the irregular geometry it has to bend and flex in order to accommodate the change in shape and that what's produced as the folds extensional fault reactivation not an episode of compression and then Sam Mahog, another student um, who was working on the questions of these older rift structures and how they were reactivated, was able to use that to explain these rather unusual structures that we see in the Dampier uh, and the Beagle subbasins. These, these very, very large synclines. You know, normally you'd expect a rift basin to be associated with, with nice extensional faults and a graben type structure. 
but very commonly um, along the, the, the margin of the northern Carnarvon Basin, we see these rift basins are characterized by these very large synclines. So by sort of looking at the uh, position of the, the Mesozoic faults and where we think those Paleozoic faults were that we mapped, Amy had mapped and Sam mapped on the other side of the fault, that idea of the faults when they reactivate, sort of two separate faults being offset and meeting in the middle, producing this highly, um, well, ramp flat geometry uh, fault can then account for the folding that we see both the synclines and the anticlines that um, are developed in the Dampier subbasin. And you can see the structure of that syncline changes quite a little bit along strike, and you can account for that change in uh, shape of the syncline by varying degrees of offset and shapes of offset between the older Permian faults shown in red and the younger Mesozoic faults shown in, uh, shown in blue. So that's the cross-sectional, the effect, the effect of the reactivation of the cross-sectional geometry. When we look in the um, map view, we can also see the effects of the, um, the uh, Permian age faults on the younger Mesozoic faults that developed. So these maps are really showing Mesozoic age faulting. So you can see in the, in the map on the left-hand side, the dominant sort of, again, north-northwest uh, orientation of a lot of the extensional faults. On this map, there's not much shown in the Roebuck Basin, but uh, again, subsequent mapping by Peng and other of our PhD students shows those north-northwest faults, trending faults, extend all the way across from the Exmouth Plateau um, through these sort of central parts in here in the, uh, of the Carnarvon Basin and into the Roebuck Basin and indeed into the Bonaparte Basin. So very, very dominant uh, orientation of, um, of structure. You won't see very much of the detail, but again, on the north, there, there's those synclines forming the, the um, Dampier subbasin, the Beagle subbasin down in here. The faults actually much more complicated on the northern margin of that basin where we had those older firm Permian faults present that I've just um, shown you. And we can see that um, expressed nicely in this, this image of one of the Cretaceous horizons that mantles the top of the fault block. So um, the lighter shades of blue and green and yellow are higher areas, the purple are deeper areas on this map. And you can see these sort of two different orientations of faults, the northeast, um, uh, southwest trending faults and the sorry the, the north northeast trending faults that you can um, see through um, through here. So that sort of structure is very reminiscent of the different orientations of faults that we see in um, both numerical models and analog models of oblique rifts, where there's a structure, an older structure with one orientation, and the faults on the flanks of the rift system tend to line up with that, and the faults within the rift system form at a higher angle to the um, obliquely oriented superimposed extension direction. So applying that to this margin, we can see the um, trend of the underlying Permian faults uh, that we've mapped on the other side of the Dampier subbasin, too deep to see them here, but most likely with this sort of orientation here, the east-northeast oriented extension producing these north-northwest trending um, trending Mesozoic faults that are very widespread over the whole of the Exmouth Plateau and those two faults intersecting on the edge of the Dampier um, subbasin. So giving us a, uh, an east-northeast extension direction for the Jurassic um, rift event. Again, if we go, jump back up to the um, area we were looking at a little while ago, um, just up between the um, Roebuck and the Browse basins, we looked at this section earlier, and um, although I didn't show you a map, these very prominent faults um, are these ones. That, so this actually, sorry, I should say is a map of the, oh, I'm terribly sorry. The <laughs> building work seems to have started making that's not going to disturb us too much. Is, is my microphone picking that up or not? I will. Um, it's okay, uh, just carry on. Okay, I will carry on. Yes, it's been probably noisier for me than this view. Um, but um, yeah, so, so this is a map of the top of the Triassic, this um, uh, pink horizon here. Um, these very large faults, again, are the northeast southwest trending faults that you can see through here. Those are the older Permian and Triassic age faults. And then all these more north south trending faults are these smaller ones that only affect the Jurassic section and 
again, very clearly show that when, the, when that sort of more east-west oriented extension was superimposed on the older Permian rifts, here the older Permian faults propagated upwards and a new set of faults formed at, um, formed at right angles. So very, very clear evidence for that, um, the orientation of the Jurassic extension. Again, we can see the same in the, as we come sort of back into the Carnarvon Basin in, the, in this area of the Canning Survey, where we've got those two different sets of faults um, intersecting with one another. So that actually is, um, has some very interesting implications. So uh, I say we can see plenty of evidence for northeast southwest oriented Permian Rift and then this east northeast um, oriented extension superimposed on that, extending all the way across the Carnarvon Basin into the Roebuck Basin, into the Browse Basin. And the, as we'll come back to in a moment, the slightly unusual thing about that is that if the plate boundary conditions are being set by the rifting that produce the Argo Abyssal Plain, we'd expect to see faults that are at a much higher angle to that um, extension direction indicated by the orientation of the, the reconstructed plate boundary. In other words, we'd expect the, the, the northeast southwest oriented faults to be the dominant ones if this margin was controlling that style of deformation. The orientation of the fault seems to be much more consistent with the stresses that have generated the uh, rifting on the Gascoigne and the Cuvier abyssal plains, um, producing this, this uh, say, north and northwest trending, uh, trending fault. So there's a mismatch there, I think, between the tectonic reconstruction and the, um, and the orientation of the faults. So we might come to an explanation for that uh, shortly. I'll just keep an eye on the time. Um, so that um, so, so the other thing that, that sort of what, one other thing that relates to that is the not just the orientation of the faults, but the timing of the faults. So this shows them again the top of the Triassic, the fault orientations in these two more darkly shaded areas on the map here. So sort of more middle parts of the Exmouth Plateau. Again, you see those dominant fault orientations. But what I really want to show you is the thickness of these sequences, both the latest Triassic and the earliest Jurassic sequences that thin onto the crest of those fault blocks. And again, just note in blue down here, the very thin nature of the Jurassic sediments and the very thick nature of the lower Cretaceous sediments. So here we see the thickness of the, the, the Rishan sediments, the top part of the Triassic, and we see they're very clearly thinning onto the fault blocks. In fact, the crests of a lot of these fault blocks become eroded. That's what the gaps in the map are, is where the top of the Triassic has been eroded and the, the um, or the top of the Mungaroo formation has been eroded and then the, the Rishan sediments on lap onto the tops of those fault blocks. So we know fault activity started in the Rishan over in the, um, uh, in the West, but it's um, very little evidence of fault activity um, further, to the, further to the East. It's not until we get into the Jurassic that we begin to see, again, the colours here represent different thicknesses of sediments, so the, the blues and the purples being the thicker sediments, that we see the uh, faults further over to the east becoming active. So there seems to be a um, change in timing of fault activity initiating um, uh, in the west and then becoming progressively younger as you come towards the uh, the east. And again, we'll now move back up to this part of the northern Carnarvon Basin here, close to the um, boundary with the um, Roebuck Basin. And again, here, rather fuzzy seismic section, I'm afraid, but here's the Jurassic sequence is much, much thicker over here, and very little thickness changes across the faults, suggesting that these faults are not active at all. And in fact, those faults don't become active until right at the end of the middle Jurassic. So you can see the Colovian unconformity picked out in blue. We see the faults form at that time, become eroded and onlapped by these Colovian sediments, and then Oxfordian unconformity, which marks the, um, again, the final, the final breakup. So much younger faults are uh, over in that part of the Exmouth Subbasin. And also think about that change in thickness of sediments that I pointed out to you. So this is an enormously long seismic line that um, starts in, made up from a number of different sections, it starts over in the Roebuck Basin, crosses the boundary, the Thuin Graben, the boundary between the 
Roebuck and the Carnarvon basins and then goes all the way across the Exmouth Plateau to where we had those very thin Jurassic sediments that I pointed out um, previously. So that's just the whole of the, thick, the, the, whole of the Jurassic um, filled in there. So Triassic fault, act or fault activity initiating the Triassic over here, much later, uh, not till the end of the Middle Jurassic over there, and this big thick Middle Jurassic sequence prograding from, um, uh, from east to, to, to west. And we can see some sort of fantastic details of that um, lower and middle Jurassic uh, sequence. So again, now looking at this um, little survey in here towards the um, northern part of the Exmouth Plateau, you see those prograding sequences really nicely in sediment, in the sedimentary sequences. On what is now a high, there was, uh, again, another interesting thing, completely planed off, completely flattened by the Valanginian unconformity. You see how flat that top surface is at the top of this fault block, probably implying that was somewhere above wave base during the uh, Valanginian, which well, might be useful in trying to reconstruct relative uplift uh, during that stage of the rift event. But um, just to, again, just really just to show you the prograding sequences, but if we look in this lower sequence down here where we can see the channels indicated, we have these really beautiful images of, uh, you can see meandering our canyon systems here and here. Um, you see really nice, th those are being fed by these really nice um, uh, uh, semicircular slump scarps here. So slumping, which must be at the top of the slope, gullies marking the, the, the slope itself. Um, you can't make out the canyon systems very easily there because they're long and straight and all the sediments being transported down them. So they only get filled by mud. So there's not very much acoustic impedance contrast with the other shelf sediments. It's only when the, the gradient of the channel systems flattens out towards the bottom of the slope, they begin to meander, deposit the, the sandstones, producing these really nice, uh, nicely imaged meandering systems, and then sort of opening into, um, opening into uh, fans at the base. So we know that we have a uh, mark picked out by this white line. And again, these thicker sediments represent a Jurassic uh, shelf edge system that is prograding or, or transporting sediments from, from east to west uh, in that area where fault activity was relatively limited. But what's also interesting, if we jump across the Thuin Graben, so I suppose this, this structure that marks the boundary between the two basins, and we look in this um, area of the Roebuck Basin. Again, we see the same prograding sedimentary sequences. And when we look at the, 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 the characteristics again of a, a, of a slice through that seismic data, at first it's a little bit difficult to see anything, but you can maybe just make out a few changes here in the amplitude in the map shown in blue. It becomes a little bit more clearer when we look at the variance, so the difference between adjacent seismic traces. And we see a number of much smaller, much broader meandering uh, channel systems that are all cutting across one another. So rather than the big canyon systems we see, saw previously, these sort of cross-cutting little meanders are much more indicative of fluvial um, systems so that we can envisage a sedimentary system that comprised maybe a fluvial delta top, delta front in the Roebuck Basin that was then feeding this uh, pro-delta slope with its slumps and canyons and meandering systems in the Carnarvon Basin. In other words, that says that the Thuin Graben, this big structure in between the two, didn't exist in the, um, in the Lower and Middle Jurassic and only formed, um, only formed later. So um, to summarize that part of the evolution, we can see this very consistent east-west, west-north, um, uh, so, so yeah, approximately east-west extension across the Carnarvon and Roebuck basins. Uh, we see the, um, the it initiates in the west and becomes progressively younger over to the east. And it's very, very short-lived when you get actually close over to the Argo Abyssal Plain, um, where we had those very thick sequences of sediment. So in, in this area over here. So as I said, all those things together don't seem to be particularly consistent with a lot of um, rifting and development of the Argo Abyssal Plain at that time on this part of the um, this part of the margin. Um, 
perhaps one reason for that is when we look at the Triassic faults, as I pointed out earlier, a lot of them are detached. They, they, they die out within the lower part of the Triassic sequence. So that was the long section we looked at earlier. We can also see that um, in this area here, sort of close to the boundary, what is the boundary between the, the Carnarvon and the Robux Basin. Very clear Lystric faults with nice rollover anticlines, very large scale faults. So again, suggesting Lystric faults that detach within the Triassic, which is, um, and, and the level at which they're probably detaching uh, is in the, um, the, uh, the locker shale, so the a shale sequence that um, formed at the base of the Triassic when there was a transgression, the Permian carbonates I referred to earlier were, were drowned um, by a widespread transgression at the start of the Triassic, producing the widespread locker shale, and that possibly acts as a detachment for um, a lot of these faults. So if the fault system's detached, where well, we have detached fault systems, rather than being controlled by tectonic stresses, they could equally as well be a result of gravitational forces. So that would imply either a slope in the continental margin, perhaps associated with, picked out by that east uh, to west progradation of the sedimentary systems, or in fact, even differential sedimentary loading. But the, the faulting actually extends well beyond the extent of the sediment, um, sediment load. So just to finish with, uh, very, I'll just very quickly nip through the, <laughs> the rest of the history of the margin. So that's, the, that's the, 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 the sedimentary system we've been looking at in the lower and the middle Jurassic. What's really interesting is that after the middle Jurassic, after the Argo abyssal plain formed, there was a, a complete change round in the sedimentary systems. And we have the much thicker sequences actually forming the, the Barrow Delta or Barrow Shelf Edge down in the south. So sediment clearly coming from this direction and massive amounts of erosion, very deeply eroding on conformities just to the south of that. So there's clearly a lot of uplift. Some people associate that with the presence of a, a mantle plume or maybe certainly a site of igneous activity. A lot of uplift in this area that um, supplied sediment uh, from the south. Very, very thin sediment over much of the, of, of this, rest of this time over much of the rest of the Exmouth Plateau. And then of course, once the Cuvier Abyssal Plain formed and the uh, Cape Range Fracture Zone developed, then that sediment supply was cut off. And, and, and again, even though it's not shown here, you can maybe just pick out a little change in color here, which reflects sediment then coming from the, um, from the west again due to localized uplift associated with that part of the breakup. But that's another whole complicated story. So then we're into the passive margin. And as I say, it's not really a very passive margin as it, um, uh, as it happens. This is, uh, there are a number of different pulses of compression that occur through the upper Cretaceous and particularly um, in the, probably the Oligocene and the Miocene and continue to the present day. So this is the, this is the Exmouth Arch, which you can uh, see in the map on the right hand side. You can see the, the so this is a map of the seabed. So this is showing the topography that is present on the, um, uh, on the seabed. There's of course the Cape Range anticline. Lucky enough, because I could, we could only have holidays in WA. I went up to Cape Range uh, earlier in the year. So fantastic outcrops of the, the anticline there, which actually continues off in Cretaceous sediments um, underneath the shelf edge here. And then this um, uh, uh, similarly um, expressed anticline on the seabed, actively growing at the present day. You may just be able to make out some little dots on the inset map. Those are all the historical earthquakes of magnitude five or greater. So there's, there's a lot over the whole of the, the Northwest Shelf, but the, not clustered, but, but there's, there's, there's a certain number around the, um, around the anticline. And then of course that's associated with the development of all these spectacular slumps that you can see um, on the margin. So a combination of the um, seismic shocks, the growing slope, um, presence of fluids. We can see these, these sort of pockmarked areas here all create the slope instability that um, results in the collapse of the flanks of that um, anticline. So I think the important to say it's not such a passive margin. So that's an awful lot of geological history in a short period of time. So I hope you've um, been able to uh, uh, keep up with it. But just to, uh, to, to summarize, um, really important to understand the, the Permian Rift, where we can see it and, and, and to be able to understand how that Northeast Southwest trending rift has established the main geometry of the margin, influenced the lithospheric structure and the subsequent structural 
um, styles. Then after that event, we um, rifting continued and volcanic activity continued in the Triassic in certain parts, but the Jurassic, or let's say the, the Mesozoic rifting actually started at the end of the Triassic and migrated from east to west um, in the uh, middle Jurassic. Vertical propagation of the faults resulted in the formation of the fault propagation folds, not a result of inversion. I haven't really talked about it, but the, the lower Cretaceous extension is very, very limited um, uh, and um, but it's associated with this uh, localized uplift, this change in the, the sedimentary system that we saw. And then after that, the breakup of Greater India resulting in the passive margin, but from the upper Cretaceous onwards, episodic development of um, compressional structures. So I think the studying the structures and the stratigraphy gives us a lot of insights that help to maybe refine um, some of the plate tectonic models and give us um, plenty information that we can um, we can use uh, for things like underworld and uh, the badland models that we're um, developing as part of the basin genesis hub. So thank you very much. I shall leave it leave it there. Thank you very much, Chris, and, and these are virtual claps. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we find that. Uh, speakers finish and there's no clapping and it's a bit disappointing but <laughs> great so, you should have some canned clapter canned yeah, clapping tried it, it blocks it kind of like your noise in the background was getting blocked so oh that's good i'm glad about that i, was, I could hardly hear what i was saying so I, I, thought, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it must have sounded pretty awful for you but i'm glad it that wasn't too no, it was fine it was fine good. so um i'm astounded I thought that passive margins were truly passive. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an interesting thing. So, um, I mean, Australia is, is, is a little bit of a, an unusual case, but, but, but on the Atlantic margin um, uh, of, of Northwest Europe, we also see compressional structures developed. There, they think, you know, the idea is that it's perhaps associated with a increase in the spreading rate that sort of generates a compressive stress that's transmitted through the oceanic crust. But in the case of, Australia, it's just we're, we're sort of surrounded by plate boundaries, you know, subduction to the north, spreading centres to the south and either side. And, and we know just, you know, as a consequence of that, um, well, as I always say to people, how many, how many earthquakes are there in Western Australia each year? O over 700. So, you know, that's just Western Australia. So it's, we're, it's um, a lot more active than we, uh, than, than we think. Great. No, it's exciting stuff. Um, so what we normally do is ask people to put their hands up to ask a question. So you do that by going to participants at the bottom of your screen and um, then going to the hand up um, section, but I don't see any hands up. So maybe Louis has a question. Okay, I'll ask another one. I didn't really ask one before, it was more a comment. Um, so the um, formation of these faults is now very different than initially thought. So how does that affect um, exploration for hydrocarbons? Um, yeah, so, so that's, that's um, a, a very interesting question. Uh, you could say in, in, one, in one way, it, it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't matter, let's say, you know, if, if a fault block's there, you, you, you might drill it <laughs> because just because it's there uh, and you can map it out and you can, you can see that it might be a trap. Um, I, I think the things that are more important, let, let's say, are um, understanding, well, certainly the time of, of activity. So, so which tells you when, when the trap formed, where faults have been reactivated and they might breach seals. But it's actually more understanding the 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 the, the geodynamic setting actually, and the, mm. the nature of the crust and what the heat flows might be, because that in that 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 governs the the source rock yes. uh, maturity. Mm -hmm. And actually, yeah. the, the other interesting thing is 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 the Triassic source rocks. I saw I see Nadej is there, so <laughs> so I know her and her colleagues at Jesus Australia. It's it, it, it's uh, has been a subject of, of interest is so first of all it's not altogether clear what the source rock is for all the big gas fields in the mm -hmm. um in the north sea and then there's been these recent um oil 
uh, discoveries in Phoenix uh, and Dorado fields in the in that sort of little tapering bit of the the northern Carnarvon and um, uh, and, and Roebuck basins, and again that that sort of geometry of the basin and the paleogeography. How did that and 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 everything that was happening between the Permian and the Triassic? How did that influence the sedimentary environments and fasces? And and can we sort of use that to predict where there might be particularly oil prone or oil rich source rocks present? So I think those are the main applications and benefits. Mm, excellent. Okay, so we now have um, two questions in line. I'm first going to go to Chris Kluthwick and then John Menzies. So Chris has actually typed into the chat. Chris, this, Chris is the one who's showing his um, video. Uh, do you have any constraints on the initiation of the Permian rifts? Could it be latest carboniferous, like the Indian Gondwana rifts? Um, yeah, so that, that's a, a good question. So I would say from the well penetrations, um, Mm, th th yes, there are there are some um, upper Carboniferous sediments within those sequences. So I think what's what's not clear to me is the is the boundary between let's say or whether there is a significant unconformity between upper Carboniferous and lower Carboniferous. So yes, I would lump upper Carboniferous and Permian together, and then the question is is whether that's separate are uh, two lower Carboniferous events. So yes, and then I, I did have a map that I, which I, I, I didn't show, but David Haig um, has done a lot of work on that, um, what he calls the pan or inter interior rift of Gondwana, the per so upper Carboniferous and um, Permian um, Gondwana interior rift that he traces all the way from uh, Timor, the Northwest Shelf, yeah, down through the western side of Australia, India, Antarctica. So yes, it's part of a bit much bigger system. Thank you. Uh, so we'll go to John. John, I think you need to unmute yourself. There we go. Hey, Chris, couldn't couldn't let you get away without a few more questions from the population out here. That's okay. Um, <laughs> Obviously, an understanding of Southeast Asia, strangely enough, relies on an understanding of the tectonics and the evolution of the Northwest Shelf. Yep. Um, Argo land and uh, Lhasa terrains both yep. appear to have originated in this part of the world. And I was, you know, I, I was wondering, obviously, you know, you're not in a position to discuss those terrains, um, but... Um, I'm just intrigued as to how long after the rifting event, rifting continued, or I should say, how long after the separation yep. of those terrains do you think rifting continued? Yes, okay. So, and, so, and possibly the orientation of, of you know, of, obviously the orientation of, uh, of subduction. I mean, I, I would think that to the northwest is more likely to the, than the east, which would have implications for that volcanism. Well, that's right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, th I think, uh, you know, the, the, so um, as I know, S S Sabine is sort of, you know, working on this idea of southerly directed subduction beneath the margin based on the occurrence of arc volcanism in the last of terrain that um, has been identified by Chinese workers. Um, as I think pr critical to understanding that is getting a, getting a handle on the geochemistry of the, um, the igneous rocks that have been encountered um, in the northern part of the Roebuck Basin. Uh, and I hope, uh, uh, talking to my geochemistry colleagues here, that the, we might be able to get something from the, the zircons that we've done the age date, dating on that might be able to help um, shed a little bit of light on that. Um, so, so one sort of slight problem I have with sort of, let's say, perceived wisdom of Northwest Shelf is that each phase of extensional fault activity is linked to a terrain disappearing off the uh, the, um, the the northwest margin, and and I, I I sort of find that a little bit difficult to to visualize because normally you, you'd expect a, a long period of rifting, and that not long period of rifting culminates in breakup, not not you know there's fault activity whoosh there goes <laughs> there goes something so 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 a lot of 
terrain separate now it's undoubtedly the case the Laza terrain and the Argo terrain end up in Southeast Asia so they must rift from that margin at some time but um, and obviously knowing when they did is, is very very difficult but I, I think we need to think more carefully about the relationship between extensional activity and the separation of those terrains actually and also the mechanism by which it occurs I think you know the, the and then and then the breakup you know, when the breakup occurs, that should stop the extensional activity. And in fact, you know, that might produce a, uh, uh, some you know, localized uplift or rebound or flexure that, that, that actually might account for some of this sort of more gravitational style of faulting. So again, uh, Patrice Ray had presented some very interesting modeling work showing how fault activity might occur or be, be concentrated at the close to a point of separation at the point at which separation occurs rather than sort of preceding it. So that, you know, those models might be, might help in our understanding of some of the, some of the observations that I um, described to you. So, and, and I think, but I think generally that holds up. We, you know, I think what's been useful is being able to understand the difference between the Colovian and the Oxfordian unconformity that sort of correspond to the, 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 the culmination of the faulting that then preceded the Argo um, break up. Uh, the, actually, the Valanginian unconformity is much, much more enigmatic. The unconformity, there's very localized uplift associated with it. There's not a lot of extensional fault activity. It's just concentrated into small areas. And that is something, yeah, I mean, just in terms of mapping extent of Cretaceous fault activity and Cretaceous uplift associated with um, Valanginian unconformity is something I'm trying to work on at the moment and then uh, hopefully we could um, you know that, that would give us a better understanding of the mechanisms associated with the the greater India um, Australia breakup um, uh, now the, the fault activity does continue after that into the into the Aptian but it's much reduced and a lot of that can just be sort of you know, differential compaction of overlying sediments sort of causing faults to propagate or little bits of tilting or very, very minor fault activity. But I would say generally the fault activity stops, the, the end of fault activity is quite well constrained by the unconformities that are associated with the, the breakup. Yeah, and that's the sort of thing you tend to see, I think, in, in Southwest Africa as well, with the yes, opening right. of the Atlantic. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, it makes a lot of sense that once you achieve breakup, there's a very dramatic change in the stress field and its yes. locus. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, I said, it's the slightly odd thing is that the, the stress field sort of prior to the Argo breakup doesn't seem to fit very well with it. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, 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 yeah. My sort of. And, and again, you. same similar things with the Valanginian. So. Yeah. So I am aware of the time. There's there's one more question, but we might wrap it up and let you speak to that person um, or whoever wants to stay on that final question, uh, considering the time. So um, if everyone could just join me again in uh, thanking Chris for a fantastic talk and um yeah we'll leave um hi ben to ask you his question okay thanks very much well thanks very much and enjoyed the opportunity yep thank, thank you. you so much uh, hi chris i have hi. hi there a couple of questions about uh, the seismic uh, reflection um, images i think it's quite fantastic and uh, it's when I saw those like uh, uh, paleo uh, graphic uh, uh, patterns, it's amazing. And I'm just wondering because you have so high resolution uh, seismic reflection profiles, have you ever done maybe to see the fault activity, like uh, see the scaling between the fault names and uh, the fault maybe uh, displacement for different. Uh, like, uh, yes, that's that's right. So, so um, I guess to go to the completely other end of the scale, <laughs> so obviously I was talking about the 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 hole margin. I mean, yes, with that 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 quality of seismic data, you can do very detailed displacement mapping on individual faults. Yeah, and, so, and also maybe you have the age constraints and then the rate of 
or the Ford XTP. That, it's that, that's right, yeah. So, so you can, um, as I say, do, do detailed mapping of stratigraphically well-constrained um, horizons and use that. So, you know, quite a lot of the data, um, actually not so much from this part, but sort of more from the um, areas close to, 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 to Timor, from the Timor Sea, um, the uh, fault analysis research group at Dublin University, they've done a lot of their work on fault growth and propagation is based on very detailed mapping of faults and mapping of displacements at different stratigraphic levels um, from faults using the, the high quality 3D data there. So um, yes, and Sam, the, the student I showed you who, who, who modeled, the, um, modeled the folds, again, part of his work was you know, looking at um, expansion indices, so looking at the change in thickness of stratigraphic units across faults. So, you know, where they're, where they're the same thickness, no movement, and then uh, according to how much the, the ratio of thickness in the foot wall to the hanging wall changes, you can sort of map out the rate at which they've grown. And by looking at that up and down the stratigraphy, when you can sort of see whether the faults are propagating up or propagating down through the stratigraphy or just forming <laughs> and, uh, and, and sort of staying fairly constant. So, um, uh, yes, that was... Um, uh, 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 there's a lot of potential for that as well. And, and, and that, that, that's sort of a good thing to, you know, it, it's actually putting all these things together, putting those physical measurements of the faults and the regional scale maps and the tectonics and then the, the, the you know, underworlds and badland type modeling, you know, integrating all those different things to, you know, really help you understand the evolution of the margin on a, on a variety of different scales. Yeah, I have so maybe the last question uh, is, Still about uh, the the fault activity maybe, I mean just uh, for the current state the stress or and also the we know like uh, for the seismicity in in Australia maybe it's not very much but uh, I mean still in Western Australia there are still like very small earthquakes that means kind of convergent stress regime for Western Australia, and and also we recently we can uh, I'm working on some. Uh, fault or the faults on the Nalaba plan and it's kind of new tectonics and I'm yeah. wondering whether in, in your case is the seismic profiles in the western shelf basin can you see kind of inversion of this uh, basins recently? Um, yes okay so so um, there was actually one slide that I um, took out at the end uh, maybe it's still there yeah um, I'll just um, uh, I'll just share my screen um, to show you that because it's um, uh, and I won't go into presentation mode because you really need to zoom into that this section to be able to to, to see it. Oh, sorry, <laughs> the the, 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 um, the the image move of the interpretation didn't. But um, again, so this is the line, the Perth Basin off the western margin. You can see, um, so this is a Permian Age fault down at the bottom, reactivated in the Mesozoic um, in this area. And then this is the Valanginian unconformity. And you can see this tiny little fold developed. Um, and, and that is probably, uh, again, actually from an IODP well drilled just adjacent to this. We now know the ages of these stratigraphic units is on that to it. So that's a and a little Oligocene age folds. And there's quite a lot of the faults reactivating the Oligocene. But um, just sort of compared to what you'll be looking at on the Nullarbor plain, so the important thing to remember is that, you know, we're probably, you know, five meters of displacement in those shallow levels is the smallest displacement we can see. So they still have to be quite big faults for us to be able yeah. to um, observe them. Yeah. I, I can see. So, yeah, but for that for the use you before, should, is it like uh, east to west, like uh, compression or north, north south? So that, that fault is trending sort of north, northeast. Um, yeah. Uh, and but quite a few of the faults in that orientation yeah. reactivate. Yes. And, and so, yes, again, the, the sort of I think from world stress map and other, well, you probably know better than me, actually, but uh, the sort of the, 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 the maximum horizontal stress is more or less east-west, I think, on that part of the margin of the present day. In Western 
for seeing a kind of east to west story. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. But, but I mean, what's interesting is that, as I say, so, some bits reactivate in the Cretaceous, some, you know, some bits in the, uh, you know, some bits in the Oligocene, some bits of the present day, and it's just all, all and I think that's another interesting project to do, actually, is to yeah, map out the different ages of compressional structures, you know, as and, I know, like a distribution to sort of get a better idea of what, what's controlling that. I, I just don't wonder because as, actually, like for kind of all the earthquakes, all the surface rupturing earthquakes in Australia is quite shallow. It's even less than one kilometer or almost uh, uh, unlimited in the shallow four kilometers. So that means like even if it's inverse for the basin, so it, it should be maybe only very shallow, like a straight, straight graphite that's the inverse. So yeah. I, it, it, it's weird and like to see only shallow, because for the continent area, it's Kraton. And we may see it's kind of shallow cases, but I don't know whether it's the same, like when the inversions in in the uh, continent shelf or the basins to the margin, whether it's still very shallow, like uh, inversion or signals, it's, it's, it's interesting to see this, how the stress is, like the conversion of stress is in the depth distribution. Yes, yeah, yeah, how it changes with that. Yes, that would be interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Chris. <clears throat> Probably should draw it to a halt and, and yeah, sure. stop the recording button right there. Oh, right, yeah, yeah.